So seeing that I'm in Austria, guten Tag, and welcome in meine Präsentation. No, I see Tim in front of me, and I think he speaks very good German. So, yeah, that was my best effort on that. Today is a bit bittersweet with me coming to uh, Vienna. It's been a place I've come to over the years, and I love it very much. And I just want to remember a friend of mine who used to live here and passed away last year. So, you know, stay safe, my friend uh, Barry. Also, one other thing, uh, my co-presenter, Leslie, uh, couldn't make it today. Um, so big shout out to Leslie. Uh, we're a good double act. I was looking forward to it. So you're stuck with me now for what we'll call the UNO Act today. So we're just after lunch. Have, sorry, I'm going to have to stay here. I was hoping to move around. So we're just after lunch, so I think we'll, we'll liven things up a bit. Hands up anyone here who's here for AI and data. Okay, there's a couple of hands down there, so maybe there's a couple of people lost. <laughs> hands up people who have heard of LLMs. Okay. Hands up anyone that even cares about LLMs. Okay, we have a few hands. Okay. All right, this is going to be interesting, I think. So imagine if we had a world where we could tune or add data to a large language model, like we can currently make contributions to open source uh, projects. So keep that idea in your head as we talk about different topics in the next 40 minutes of the presentation. So my name is Martin Hickey. Um, I work over at IBM. And I spent the last 10 plus years working in open source, contributing to Upstream. And um, yeah, I like it a lot. I really like the interactions. It's great being here this week talking to different people. And I'm very lucky to work in a company that's open source first and is willing to support me and other colleagues in the community. So today, I'm going to look at the problems with tuning LLMs. Then I'm going to look at a technique to be able to deal with that problem. And then finally, I'm going to talk about an implementation of that technique. So just a little, I suppose, recap or context around large language models. I suppose we have a big thank you to large language models and OpenAI for creating this new wave of hype around AI. So over the years, there have been different you know, hypes and troughs around AI. And we're in this current wave. And it's really put generative AI front and center. And everyone from you know, our parents to you know, aunts, uncles, whoever, are talking about AI at this moment. And what's very interesting with the way AI is going and how fast it's changing is, even with large language models. So early last year, there would have been a big push around you know, the bigger the model. So some were coming up with 40 billion parameters. They went up to 70, 100, up to 200. I don't know, maybe it's a 300 now at this stage. But something interesting came out of that was, and this is where the big, I suppose this is where the infliction moment's going to happen with this wave of AI is, how it's going to be adopted in the industry. Because if it can be adopted in the industry and put to solutions and products, etc., this, this is how AI will drive from the lab out into everyday life. And the thing that came out of that was around cost and usability and trust. And the one around cost was the bigger the model, the more parameters, the more expensive it is to run it or inference it or tune it. So there was a pushback from the industry to say, right, you know, we have to make this more cost effective. And there was a lot of work done around small language models and multimodal, et cetera. So which are small language models, I don't think there's any definition out there, but someone in research might be able to tell me. But you know, some people have said something below 20 billion parameters. So we're now looking at models that are 7 billion, 8 billion parameters, 
And can they be as effective as a model that's 100, 200 billion parameters? So I think that's one of the points to look at. And the other one's been around usability and accessibility, how we use the models, you know, like tuning or inferencing, et cetera, and then the trust aspect. So I suppose one of the big, you know, parts of the large language model has been that ability to differ it from the previous models we've had, which would be more discriminative AI, which means you were using models that were provide more predictions and they were trained for specific task was, you could now take a large language model off the shelf and use it for multiple tasks. And a, a lot of people saw the opportunities with this. And especially a lot of us who are in implementation or developers, et cetera, said, right, can we take these models and can we enhance our applications? And that has been one of the key with, with an LLM. But the other side of it has been then is the more people have used LLMs, they've said, okay, these are trained in vast amounts of data. It's unlabeled. You know, it's taken everything from the internet. We're even looking at data generation now. But you'll come to points where someone that is domain expert, that knowledge isn't in the model. So some of our clients have been looking at saying, okay, for example, you know, a company that might work with heat pumps. That knowledge around their heat pumps and their systems and stuff isn't in the model. So you'll probably argue and say, well, you've got a rag for that. Why does it need to be in the model? But I think what we're looking at here with the alignment and the tuning of, of models is, it doesn't have to be one or the other. So it can be a combination of where you, put, you tune the model as well as having rag on the side. So what I mean by that is, getting back to the heat pump example is, maybe the model can be first tuned with specific information around the types of pumps the company has. So information that doesn't change all that often. Maybe terms uh, that, are, that, are, that are part of that industry. And then maybe the rag then is when the workforce is out or when the, the staff goes out to uh, customers, et cetera, different problems they find gets put into a rag database. And what you're doing then is you're then using the model, which has the, the key uh, terms and uh, information with the rag database. So it gives you that more complete example. And what I said to you at the start to keep in mind here is, in open source, we have really, really set ways of, of making contributions. However, with our large language models, or open large language models, we have a bit of a problem. The key one being here is, it's hard to make contributions and build a new version of that model, and it's the barrier of entry. So for, in a lot of situations, you really have to know AI. And there's a problem there with that because you're only going to ever have a certain percentage of people with really deep AI knowledge. And these are data scientists, or AI engineers, etc. So in that situation, it's more challenging for clients, etc., to try and make contributions to models. And how it's manifested itself, this problem, the consequences we see is around the forking of models. Now, if you've knowledge of open source, one of the things you always try to avoid is forking. Forking a repo because you're going to go off on a different tangent, you know, that, that main repo is going to drive ahead, and it's very hard to converge that again afterwards or align that back again. And this is what we're seeing today, Llama being an example. You can see the multiple Llamas that are out there. But this is for every model, because a lot of these models are trained with data sets that may not be open. And even, they're o if, even if they're open, how do you contribute into something that's being done in-house? So what we need is a workflow or an approach that allows a model to be updated in an additive fashion. So where the, the 
contributions or the data that you want to tune the model on can be added and uh, versions of the model can be tuned. So when we're talking about tuning here, we're talking about changing maybe one level or a few levels on the top of the model. So we're not training the whole model, we just want to align it with that extra data on top. And thanks to our colleagues in IBM Research, they've come up with such a technique. And it's called the Large Scale Alignment Chatbot, or LAB for short. And they published the paper on this in around, I think it was around March uh, timeframe this year. Yeah, I think it was March, uh, March or April, March I'd say. And the key aspects to this technique is taxonomy, data generation, and alignment tuning. So if we start with taxonomy, what you're looking at here is a binary tree type structure of your data. So leaf nodes of the data, depending on the different topics. So it might be your own, they might be aligned on sport, art, history, etc. And then the different subcategories inside that. If it's sport, it might be where I come from, it'll be hurling, it might be soccer, or you know, in America, we call it American football, but they'll call it football. So, you know, you can have the different categories, the same with history and stuff. You might go through the different conflicts, etc., like that. But all that data is accessible and can be changed or contributed to. The second aspect then is, if you're going to tune a model, a number of examples isn't going to be enough to tune the model. You need hundreds, if not thousands. Now, if, some, if you're going to make or add data or make contributions to something, you're not really going to have hundreds and thousands of examples. So to be able to generate data is going to be very important in this. And especially now when a lot of the base models or all the base models, especially their last models, will have used every, every piece of data that's in the internet at this stage. So we're getting to the stage that data generation is important. So in, during this phase, the examples that you provide, and I'll look at it in a minute, maybe you know, five, 10 examples, then the data generation is going, to add, is going to act like a Petri dish where it's going to generate hundreds if not thousands of examples. The next part of that then is the validation. Hands up here who trusts the large language model's output. OK. <laughs> Uh, for those not on the video, no hand went off. Um, yes, we're still at that stage, stage of trust and, and, um, uh, and transparency with, with what comes out of the model. So during this phase, you have used, um, during the data generation, you used the teacher model, which is going to be a large language model, to generate all this extra uh, data during the data generation phase. Now, during the next phase, you want to validate if those questions and answers that come out of that are as they should be. So you want to be checking for guardrails, for HAPs, or for bias, etc., and also, is the content of them uh, good? Because we always talk about this, and I'll use the American phrase, is garbage in, garbage out. So if you go tune in the model with, with garbage data, then you're going to get garbage out afterwards. So it's very important that this data is validated before it goes in. And this, this is a, 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 an important aspect, is, you know, that you don't blindly trust what, what comes out. And then the final phase then is around uh, multi-line tuning. So where you basically take the data, and that data is tuned in different phases, and a new version of the model is uh, created. So in this situation, you've had version N, now you've version N plus 1. Okay, so the question was, uh, are the teacher models and the critic models, do they have this data, are they different, etc.? And that's a very good question, yeah. So the teacher model will be a large language model that's independent of the model you're trying to train. So this model pr will provide the data generation, uh, where you'll give it some uh, data, and you'd say you want more data generated from that. The critic model then is going to check against this. Now you can use the same teacher model to check against it, 
or you can use a different model to check to see is the content good that comes out and is the content something that you know is useful and is it also content that you want to have out there so is a proper um, is it properly tested for bias etc the model you're trying to train then or tune then is your um, student model so that's the model in the end that gets trained so they're separate to what your teacher model is etc no you know, I'll talk a while in the process, you can use the same ones if you want, but generally what you're going to be is using different ones, but you have that configuration to do it. So it's great to talk about these different stages and, and the way that you can take this data and generate it, but you're probably thinking in your own mind, oh, how much AI do I have to know for, for this technique? And the reassuring answer to this is you don't. So the lab technique defines it as recipes. And essentially what they are, are pieces of data that you can add to the model without having any knowledge of AI, et cetera. So you don't need to know any AI uh, data types like tensor, tensor in, tensor out type approach. And there's two types of recipes. One are skills and one are knowledge. And the skills is about teaching the model how to do something. So if we look at the idea of a recipe, for example, chicken parmesan, the skill here is going to be the format of the recipe. So what is, how does a, a recipe, what's its format normally? It's first of all, you usually have the ingredients first because you want to look at that. You know, if you're like me who never reads through the, the recipe properly, I just go and get the ingredients and then my wife wonders why the dinner is not ready because I didn't realize it was going to take two and a half hours. I thought it'd take an hour. But the first part is, the, the ingredients. The next part then is the steps, the format to do it. So that's the skill. What is the format of that? Then the knowledge then is the information afterwards. So if I'm using the chicken parmesan case, it's what is chicken parmesan? What are you trying to create? What kind of a dish is it? All that information around it, okay? So it'll be that information what the steps are as well, but the skill will be what format they'll be in and so forth. So here's a few examples of, of skills and knowledge. I mentioned the chicken parmesan. The other ones are owned, um, if you want to generate a table um, with every state in New England, how do you do that? So the skill there is going to be the table format. If it's numbered, what type of columns, uh, the rows, etc. So what's going to be the structure of it? And then the data is going to be the knowledge around it. So what are the states of New England? or some other country, or maybe a different country, not a state, uh, all that information like that. So that's where the knowledge comes in. The skill is around, I suppose, the format of table, tables, et cetera, like that, or if you're doing something like synonyms, et cetera, what is the synonym? So the skills can also be functional skills, where you have math skills, etc. But at the moment, it's been, I think, the more, the more concentration is around composition skills, which are skills where you're talking about different terms around tables, etc., like that, and less more around uh, maths, etc. Now, to be able to enable the technique to work and generate the content that it has to, that it has to generate is, first of all, providing a YAML file which provides questions and answers. And these questions and answers are the examples. So what you're trying to do, or what you're trying to put across. So for, an ex for a skill, it'd be if you were doing the particular table with you know, the state, New England state, and, and uh, what you'd be doing there is, what's the format of tables? How, do, how is the tables laid out? The number of contents? Different questions and answers like that, so that it gives the model enough information when it's trying to generate the content. An example I've put here is around the synonym, which is providing different examples of how a synonym works. Knowledge is, is similar in a way, but how it differs is, now with your question and answers file, you're going to have five contexts, not just five questions and answers, and then you're going to have questions and answers within those contexts. So how this works is, now you're looking at knowledge data, so you're going to be providing documents. So it's kind of similar, I suppose, if you want to look at it like RAG, 
where you're going to have a Git repository, and that Git repository is going to point to uh, one to many documents. And these documents are going to contain the information you're looking at. So if it was a textbook like you have in school, and it was to do with science, then each context might be different parts of science. So for example, when you're at a younger age, it might break up into biology, uh, physics, chemistry, etc. And then each context within that is going to have questions and answers around it, so that when it looks at the information, it's going to bring that back. An example I've here is around uh, the Phoenix constellation, and the first context around is that Phoenix is a constellation, what is a constellation, etc. The next part might be then, you know, what's within that constellation, what stars or, or moons, etc. That might be the next context, and so on and so on. So you're providing pointers to your data documents so that the model can go after those areas of the data and then generate more data from that. So I've put forward what we needed to be able to make contributions to a model. And this idea of the lab technique that provides you with this process or technique where you can define your data in a taxonomy tree and use that data then to generate more data to tune your model. And you can do this in an additive fashion because every time it tunes the model, it's starting with a base model each time, taking the taxonomy you have and any new additions to it, and then tuning a version of the model each time. This is great in theory. What you need here is, and what our clients will need to be able to do this is, an implementation of this, or a process, or a flywheel of how do we use this technique? And how can we do it in a regular basis? And how can we have different versions of our model? And that brings me to Instruct Lab. Instruct Lab is the vehicle or the implementation for the lab technique. It's a community that was born out of a collaboration between IBM and Red Hat, where we realized that the ability to tune models wasn't there. And when, we, when it was recognized with this lab technique that you could tune models in an additive fashion and have different versions of the model of Farkinum, it was a no-brainer to go forward and provide it into, into the open and community. The key goal, I suppose, around Instruct Lab itself is using open source knowledge to build models. And these are different types of open source models that are available. Now, if you were at the keynotes on uh, yesterday, which is Monday, wasn't it? Today's Tuesday, yeah. OK. When you lose days in between uh, <laughs> at conferences. Um, but yesterday, there was a great discussion around how do we define how models are open, or how open they are? And this is using the uh, model open framework, isn't it? The MOF, the MOF. And what was described at the time was, this is still really a sliding door. We're still trying to define what's fully open or not open, and we're still working towards that. And previously, when I showed our own large language models, I showed some of the families of models that were there. I showed a granite model from IBM. I showed a Mistral model. I showed um, the Gemini model from, from Google, etc. And all those models have various levels of openness. I know from the granite model, they're, they're, they're very open in the data set, etc. And Mistral as well. Llama, you know, it's in between with the data sets and stuff. And the others then are still open to debate. So when we were creating the, the Instruct Lab open source community, our key goal here was going to be around accessibility. Because you know, I, I talked initially around the three things for, for clients is you know, cost effectiveness, accessibility, and trustworthiness. Well, if developers can't use models easy, then we can't develop content. You know, we can't make applications, we can't make services using it. So being able to play with models has become very important. And I've talked about the large language models. I've talked about looking at small language models. But trying to run models, you know, it requires a huge amount of hardware in some situations. But we wanted to make it accessible from day one. 
So our entry point was off-the-shelf accessible hardware like a Mac. A Mac MX, an M1, 2, or 3, a uh, minimum of 32 gigs of RAM. You probably get away with 16 gigs if you have 10 gigs free. You know, if you're running Safari, kill Safari because it, it, it's going to eat, eat memory for you. So that's one piece of advice I give you in Slack as well. They're a bit heavy on, on it if you're trying to check. But the idea here is that you could download and play with models or experiment with them. You could then try out skills and knowledge contributions. So what information you're trying to add. So for example, you know, if you, if you have a sport that has very limited information in it and you're checking a particular model, then you might say, right, I want to add my, my knowledge, add more information on, on that sport or a particular, I don't know, uh, history topic, etc. No, probably a lot of that will be there because of the information to train the models to start with. And the final one then is, how do you test that afterwards? Once you do the data generation and the tuning, how do you test afterwards to see if that model has the information you want? So the workflow uh, generally works on, first of all, taking whatever your base model is going to be. So this might be you know, um, an SLM probably, if you, if you want to try that out. It depends what you're trying to, trying to build. Probably for a lot of clients, it's going to be an SLM, maybe seven-bit model, et cetera. And the next thing, thing then is being able to try that out in, in, your own, in your own system, maybe your own laptop, et cetera. Uh, now, the CLI is quite configurable as well, and I'll touch on it in a minute, because it can be broken down into different parts, and it can connect to different instances of data generation, tuning, et cetera. But you can also, as I say, run it on your laptop. Now, the next part then is, if you're happy with what the contribution you want to add to the model or the model to be tuned with, then you can push that like any contribution you do in open source in, with a PR. Because that's the key goal you want to do. Yes, maybe if you're like me, you want to pair around with the CLI and you enjoy you know, making um, updates to the code. But for some people, it'll be just getting that contribution, getting a new, uh, a new um, version of the model. And then the back end works then. So to do the full end to end then, you need quite a powerful back end. Um, when we started initially, it was about 128 GPUs and took about 25 plus hours. But well, we're fine tuning that as we go along to try and bring it down, etc. But what you have to remember here is you're doing a full end to end here of data generation, uh, validation, and tuning of, of a model. So, you know, if you've if you've in that field around models and you've had exposure to it, you realize that some of these models are quite um, resource intensive and time intensive to, to be able to tune the model. And what you're looking at here then, and then finally then, is the new version of the model. And I suppose what you're looking at here more on the left hand side, you're looking at more probably locally, maybe connecting to something externally, and then the other side, the back end, that's all the back end server where it's going to take that contribution and validate that contribution and see if you can bin the model using, using the contribution. The CLI, here's some of the commands you can use. You know, you can, you can play around with the different models. If you bring down a model, you can chat with the model. Uh, that's, you know, in technical terms, that's like inferencing with the model, asking it different questions, etc. You can check out then if you make a contribution. You know, it's like a Git repository when you make a contribution to the taxonomy to see if it's picking up your, uh, your changes and also if your changes are valid. And then the other two then is around doing your data generation and doing your uh, tuning. I'll just put a few notes down around, and you can see the flow of fully on your right hand side, and you'll see that in the community. Uh, you can get that off the community page. So when we're doing it straight on a Mac, and we're doing the whole workflow on a Mac, just remember you're going to be using quantized models, which are more reduced size models, so they're not using the full 16-byte uh, um, integers. They're more 4-byte integers. Um, and they, they're going to have a lower fidelity, i.e. they may not be as effective as if you're using a full model. Also, uh, there's a modified version of the data generation and tuning. And this is so that it'll run on accessible hardware. Now, a lot of work is going into the community now and going forward around making that workflow more configurable. So, i.e., what I said earlier is, if you have data generation that's running on s some server, you know, where the model can be hosted and running there, and has maybe, I don't know, um, four uh, A100s, 
maybe with, I don't know, 30, with 60 gigs of, of RAM or more each, then, you know, you can use uh, a more uh, expansive version of data generation. So that's all configurable, and we have different profiles and stuff depending on what your hardware is, and we're geared towards that because we realize not everyone's going to have the hardware or they'll have different stages of hardware. The same with the tuning, etc. There's also a UI. So if you don't like YAML or you don't like CLI, then there's the ability and where you have really good knowledge that you think a particular model could do it, then you can do it through the UI. And in that situation, then you're just adding your content there and it can do a backend uh, try out of your content, do data generation, et cetera, and then you can push that content, then it'll push that content for you up as a PR into the community. So you don't even have to do git push. It'll be all, it'll be all automated for you, or abstracted. Just a quick look at the back end. Um, so here, it's, it's the whole part of doing the full data generation. And just remember, each time, it's taking that taxonomy, that full taxonomy each time, and it's building it on a base model. It does the full data generation. The filtering phases is going to look at that data, our validation phase to see, right, you know, was the data generation, is it good to go? Is it, is it um, has it got good content? Uh, and also, is it got something that is responsible and something that, that's, um, that's non-biased? Uh, then you're looking at why it's multi-tuning uh, multi is because it's done in two phases. The knowledge is done first, and then the skills tuning is done. And then finally, that's evaluated during each phase to see how the model has reacted after it. And then finally, then, the model is published from there. So that'll be when you know, contributions have been made, and you want to build a model and publish that model. So I'm just going to do a quick jump out. Can everyone see the um, terminal? OK, so I don't have any demo as such, uh, but what I want, because trying to show the data generation and the tuning, <laughs> even on, even uh, modified on, on, on the laptop would take at least 15 minutes, 20 minutes for data generation, and the same for the tuning. So I don't think anyone wants to stay around that long for that, and we've been on top of the other person. But just a quick look at the CLI. So the CLI is called iLab. If I can type, you can do an iLab help, and that'll bring up the different um, uh, commands or group commands that are there. So you've config data model, etc. And let's do a quick iLab chat. So as I said, the chat is like inferencing or asking a question to the model. So what happens in this situation? It'll use the default model. It should use the Merlinite model. So what's happening in the background here is. On the Mac, we're using uh, Llama CPP as the hosting server to do it. So hosting means, you know, with a model, if you haven't heard it before, to use a model, it's going to have to run. So whether it runs, you know, in Python, uh, as a Python process, or however it's hosted, uh, you have to have that model so you can call it. And the great work that's been done in the last few years around hosting, especially in the last year or two with the different um, uh, server frameworks is, we're putting developer-friendly APIs around it, usually REST APIs. So we can call this through a REST API. And what we've noticed in the industry as well is, you know, in different communities, we've tried to define an API, a uh, standard API, but we're still working towards that. And a lot of the server runtimes are now providing the open AI API because the API was defined and out there. So let's ask a question. What is, I don't know, something simple. What is a dog? So it's great. It tells me information. I'm using the Merlinite 7B Q4 model. So what that means is quantized down to uh, four byte uh, integers. So, okay, you can get out of it like there. You can also lo you look at your lab uh, taxonomy diff. And you can see here I made some changes inside in synonyms. And uh, you can see it's telling me it's valid. So that's important that if you're going to do the YAML yourself on the command line, you know, is, is the format incorrect, et cetera, for that, and that will tell you, and also have you enough examples and stuff like that, it's going to tell you that. The last thing I'm going to show is that you can also, yeah, I was going to actually show it, uh, yeah, let's run it. No, no, I'll have to put in, put in a password, so I'll leave it there for the moment. Um, 
I'm going to run a model, a different model. So this was a model I trained previously. I'm just going to start it up. So when I called iLab chat earlier, it's going to go and call a process to kick off the uh, LAM CPP and kick off uh, that particular uh, model. In this situation, I've started the model itself. It's uh, the IBM Granite model. And now I'm going to chat with that. So you can see here now I'm using Granite model instead of the other model. So you can start the model yourself if you want, if you have a model running somewhere else. So we have support both in uh, Mac and in Linux. In Linux, we're using VLLM, if you've heard of VLLM for uh, server hosting. Um, and um, on the Mac at the moment, we're using the MLX framework for the tuning, which is using things like QLORA as a tuning algorithm. Uh, on Linux, we're using uh, Deep, Deep Search, Deep Speed, sorry, and that's using uh, LoRa as well for, for some of the tuning. Okay. So again, here I can ask it a question: um, What is Vienna? It's going to tell me it's the capital of Austria. Great. So if you want to try it out, get down to CLI, play around with it if you want, and, 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 and see what you think of it. So let's get back to the deck. How are we on time, folks? OK, we're nearly there. We're about three minutes, so that's good. So one thing I asked you to think about before we got into this was, do we have a way where we can add contributions to, to models and, train, and tune those models to give different versions in an additive fashion, like we do in open source communities today? Thanks to the lab technique and the Instruct Lab community, we now have that flywheel to do this. So in the community, we're going to be working forward with different open source models, tuning them and publishing versions of them on Hugging Face. But we'll probably also be doing in other catalogs as well, going down the line, like Olama, etc. depending where we see the community goes. But the key point here is clients now have a vehicle or a flywheel to do this. They can take Instruct Lab and they can use it in their own uh, data centers. To, to tune models to the content they want. So as I said, the example I used earlier around a company that's maybe doing heat pumps, they can now take specific content they have or specific knowledge they have that doesn't change very often and tune the models themselves. Now, yes, they might need the hardware. If they have the hardware, great. If they don't, then they may use different providers to do that. But they have that vehicle to do it and ways of pointing to the different stages, you know, configuring the different stages to do that. Or I think going down the line, a lot of clouds will host this capability because the value it will bring to clients and so forth. So if you're interested, um, please come out. Um, you can have a look at, um, you can scan the QR code there. And that'll give you the information you want. That'll bring you to, let me just bring it up. It'll bring you out to the. Uh, it'll bring you out to the to the main uh, web page, and you can click on uh, looking at the community and stuff like that. You can also read the paper, etc. That behind it, the, the lab paper, and then here's the the documentation. You want to go into the documentation to try it out, or go into any of the repos um, that are back here. Just let me. That back up. So I need your repos here. You can check them out. And if you have any questions, I'll be, do we even, we probably don't have time for questions, do we? No, we're right on time. So if you have any questions, just reach out to me in the hallway. I'll be outside afterwards. Or if you just see me over t today or tomorrow or whatever, please come down. Uh, just an FYI, I have a talk tomorrow on um, the behind the scenes, how this community kicked off between two companies. And you know, I suppose even though Red Hat and IBM are, are tied together in a way, we still operate as two separate companies. So it'll be interesting to see how the interface between us worked, how we used open source to help us to drive this forward before we eventually then able to 
do a soft launch out to the community and all the things starting from scratch right up along. So it's an interesting bit by bit if you're, if you're into that kind of thing. So please join me tomorrow. I think it's around 2 o'clock. Okay, thank you very much.